This is the final episode in my series, Life and Leadership Lessons from Teddy Roosevelt. And I've really enjoyed this series, and, but at the same time, I'm glad it's not a 24-part series uh, because I really feel that this is a landing spot. I, can, I, I have this idea, or at least this vision, sort of like a gymnast sticking it at the end of this one, and I feel like it'll be well-polished. Like, there's a lot more to Teddy Roosevelt's life I am not covering. And there, I want to say, I heard someone say that they've read over 500 books about Teddy Roosevelt. And I was thinking, 500? How? I mean, I didn't even know there was even close to that amount. So if you want to do a deeper study on Teddy Roosevelt, I think there are tools available to you. This is a very skim milk understanding of this man. And isn't that interesting to think? He only lived 60 years, and I'm barely scratching the surface in 12 messages. And so how much depth really is there to our lives? There's a lot. There's a lot of nuance to each of us that if we allow the spirit of God to dive in, there's so much richness in how he builds an individual life. But I'm just expecting, I have this desire to see this particular message shine in our souls. And I can't make that happen. I can't force that to happen. I need the grace of God to, to do it. So Lord, help us with this. Part 12, the Blackstone Hotel. Now, I, I purposely named it something somewhat obscure, lest you try and put pieces together and figure out how this final act is going to work. However, the last two messages have been about a friendship between Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. And the two men working together is something special. And Teddy is going to impact the world, maybe unlike any president before him or after him. It's hard to say that because you know, Lincoln was, and Washington were fairly influential presidents. Uh, but one of the things that's powerful about Roosevelt is his ability, his ability to see crisis and avert it. Whereas most presidents run straight into crisis and that's what defines them. It is how they then overcame it. But Roosevelt is never going to have a major crisis in either of his presidencies, which is wholly unusual, and it doesn't really make any sense unless you are able to see that he perceived what was happening. And part of his ability to perceive it was his good friend, William Howard Taft. And so his collaboration with Taft is going to lead him to be a very successful president. And then Roosevelt, after two terms, is going to put all his weight behind Taft, I shouldn't use the word weight when I'm talking about either of those two. But he's going to put all of his strength behind Taft, and Taft is going to be elected in 1908. The dream of Teddy is that he could be followed by someone who gets his policies, who can carry on the torch, take that baton and run it. And so in the last episode, which was called The Fracture, we're going to see Roosevelt leaves for a safari in Africa, and he's going to start hearing rumors Rumors that Taft has left the agenda behind, and he has now returned to the old guard Republicans. And, I mean, that's the worst thing that could ever happen in, in Roosevelt's mind. Meanwhile, Taft is going to start interpreting things like the fact that he gave him a going-away gift, but Roosevelt never said thank you. I mean, ridiculous stuff that all of us look at is like, well, that's dumb. Yeah, but so are our issues. <laughs> so are the things that we oftentimes hyperbolize or blow out of proportion. They're dumb. The enemy doesn't need intelligence to work with. He just needs our emotions. He needs our wonderings, our ponderings, and he fans them into flame and they turn into grand stories of drama and woe. And that's what we see here. We're going to see a falling apart of this great friendship. Almost all because of misunderstanding. In fact, because we are able to, in history, now go back and examine all of Taft's workings, what he was doing, what he was saying to the people around him, his entire esteem for Roosevelt throughout the beginnings of his presidency. He wasn't like throwing it out. He was desiring to fulfill it. And because we know what was going on in Teddy Roosevelt and we can hear all the different comments, we can see him respond saying, hey, I'm not going to respond to that until I can look into it further. And we see the character in both the men, but we see them being played. We actually could recognize this could have been totally avoided. Have you ever watched that in a movie where it's just like, if these two people would just talk, everything would have been fine. Of course, you wouldn't have had a movie then either. But the same is true here. If these two had just had a meeting of the minds, Roosevelt, when he returned from Africa, should have gone straight to the White House and said, let's sit down, Willie. 
I want to hear what's going on. Explain this to me. Instead, he interpreted everything that was happening through his informants. And that's what broke them apart. And this, I mean, I have to admit, the last episode was heavy because of that. It's hard to see something break apart, but that's the reason I gave it is because this was what happens to us in the body of Christ. We have fractures, denominations that spring up, bull moose parties, as I said in this last episode, that ought not to be. They actually rob from our strength as the church. They don't actually help anyone. They're based oftentimes on our personal pride, our agenda instead of God's. So part 12, is there any redemption to this story? I don't know. Let's find out. The pain of a nation. It's interesting to me how many people in the nation were broken, heart broken over the fact that these two turned against each other. It's just interesting to me. I understand it personally that if I had a relationship that was so close, but then there was a divide in it, I can understand it personally why I would have an ache over it, but that others would have it. I think there's something to that. It's really hard for us to witness something sweet broken apart. Two of the pain of a nation, two of their most beloved leaders were at war with one another. And guess what? Everyone was, there was all sorts of different people that were trying to get these two back together, trying to strategically bring them into the same room and give them a chance to talk because many people knew there was just misunderstanding, especially the people that were close, like Archie Butt, his aide. He was the aide for both of them. He deeply loved both of them and he's watching them walk through this nonsense because they can't hear each other anymore. So the Blackstone Hotel, 1918. So there's a picture of the Blackstone Hotel. I don't know that it really helps my message, but I can at least prove that it's a real place, right? It's a fancy uh, hotel. And this is gonna take place in the dining room of the Blackstone Hotel. So I actually have, I think that's a painting. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but this is about what it would have looked like in 1918 uh, when this story is unfolding. When there is fractured fellowship, is there still hope for unity? It's a good question. I mean, the Ellerslie experiment, what our desire is here at Ellerslie is that we would be able to see denominationalism overcome. It's a passion that we have. And when we have a semester here, we see it all the time. I don't know how many people have eyes to see what we do as leaders, but I have been in so many different churches and I know the power of denominationalism and the hold it has. I watch people from every conceivable conservative Bible-believing uh, zone of Christianity come together and not focus on the differences, but focus on the similarities. And I, I mean, I've seen it semester after semester after semester after semester. And some of the students really taste it. They get it. They recognize that this shouldn't work this way. That's right. According to the system, it shouldn't work. But according to the working of God's grace, this is what he specializes in if we give him space to do it, as opposed to starting with the premise that it can't be done. When you start with the premise that it can't be done, I guarantee you it will not be done. However, if you start with the premise that God is greater than these divisions, that he specializes in something known as reconciliation, then we lean on him and we say, Lord, show it in this generation. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Now I plead with you, brethren, this is a church that is marked by division. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say that each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Come on, guys, what is this? This isn't how the body of Christ works. What I just read is modern Christianity, but since we all grew up in it, we don't question it. We are denominationalized from our onset. We don't know the church outside of denominations. So therefore, we don't question it. It's part of the package we inherit, which is why I always like to bring it up and say, should we accept it, guys? Give me one scripture reference to defend accepting it. Everything in scripture in the New Testament is gonna tell us the opposite of the way that we function in this arena. So here's our shortened version of that in 1 Corinthians 1. I plead with you that there be no divisions among you. 
2 Corinthians 5.18, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's a ministry, and all of us are entrusted with this. Now, I want, to us, I want to have us apply this to this Taft-Roosevelt relationship. Because in a sense, we're in this relationship, whether or not we know if we're Taft or Roosevelt, we still are in a relationship like this. I have a lot of people in my life, and this is going to sound strange and jarring maybe in light of everything I'm talking about, where I have a very difficult time talking with them. And it's not because I wouldn't want to. It's just that there's this fog bank of awkwardness that is built up over the years, oftentimes because I've, you know, been criticized or condemned or, you know, accused. I'm not exactly sure how to enter back into a relationship with that person right now. I would be very nice to them if they were here, but how do I go after it when it's them accusing me? What, what do I do? What's my, hey, it's like, hey, I don't care all the things you've said about me. I'm going to overlook that. And then they say, well, I still mean them. Yeah, so it's sort of hard to have intimacy in that relationship, right? I understand where division comes from, but I also know where the remedy comes from. It starts, of course, it's the spirit of God that is going to do it. But it also, the spirit of God is going to be able to work in and through humility. If there is pride, it's not going to work. It's only humility that actually God is able to work in and through to bring about reconciliation. So this awkward challenge that we're going to see is going to be in existence for six years. So 1912 election, remember the Bull Moose Party, just disaster, the nation is going to be, the Republican ticket's going to be split. Woodrow Wilson becomes president. So we end up with a weak president because of this division amongst the Republicans between Taft and Roosevelt. Six years, they haven't talked. And there's been multiple agendas, you know, to get these two together. It's like, hey, if they could just talk. We want, our, we want Willie and Teddy to talk again, please. I mean, it's weird that people would want this, but this is a big deal. These are two of their heroes in this country. So six years of painful fracture, it seems impossible to recover what was lost. Doris Kearns Goodwin, who wrote The Bully Pulpit, said this, over the years since the contentious 1912 election, mutual friends and political allies had repeatedly tried to reunite Roosevelt and Taft, but their infrequent meetings had been neither cordial nor intimate, marked by what Taft deemed armed neutrality. Goodwin says this, in 1915, they had both served as honorary pallbearers at the funeral of Yale professor Thomas Lounsbury. Taft made the first overture, extending his hand to Roosevelt. How are you, Theodore? He asked. The colonel merely shook hands silently without smiling, and no further communication passed between them. Reconciliation needs a Taft. Now, remember, this whole series is on life and leadership lessons from Teddy Roosevelt, but Teddy Roosevelt needed a Taft. Taft is looking for an opportunity. That's why you're going to see him even extend the hand here. This hurts him so much. He is a, he's a big teddy bear. I mean, it's funny because the term teddy bear comes from Teddy Roosevelt. But the best teddy bear is Taft. He's such a big-hearted guy. And this breaking between him and Roosevelt is killing him physically, mentally, emotionally. He wants it to be restored, but he has no idea how to take a first step. So reconciliation needs a Taft. This is the encouragement to me in this story, is that if you're willing to be the Taft, and you're willing to get uncomfortable and to take the first step, amazing things can happen. Now, I can't guarantee you that Roosevelt's going to not give you the cold shoulder back, but this story is such a profound story because of William Howard Taft. So reconciliation needs a Taft. One of the parties in the fracas must be humble enough to take the first step. Prepared to act, actively looking for the moment of opportunity. Now, if you have any breaking in your life of relationship, you know, that sort of awkward haze that can be there where you, it's very uncomfortable if you see the person just, you know, in the grocery store, or in the airport, whatever it is, like, ha, huh, do you hide? Do you run into the bathroom real quick? Taft was looking for Roosevelt. He wanted the opportunity, even though he didn't have a clue what he was going to do if he ever ran into it. He just knew that nothing was ever going to get out of parking into first gear unless he did something. 
So for six years, he's looking for it. Obviously, you know, the Yale funeral uh, didn't turn out in any way that would have been healthy, but at least he tried. Have you ever tried and then you think, well, I'm not gonna try again because that was awkward. Are you willing to try and try and try again? The window of opportunity, when it opens, you must be ready. And the one thing that's very special about Taft in this story is he's ready. And it's gonna happen in 1918 at the Blackstone Hotel. Doris Kearns Goodwin says this, learning that Teddy was an enduring in operation to remove a fistula, Taft sent him a sympathetic telegram. So we're not yet to 1918, but you're gonna see Taft looking for opportunities. So he is gonna send a telegram uh, to uh, Roosevelt in this situation where he's in the hospital. And Roosevelt's gonna respond. And he says, I'm rather rocky, but worth several dear men. Teddy jested in reply, greatly touched and pleased by your message. This is going to be to Taft the signal that maybe, just maybe Roosevelt's is wanting the same thing he is. Doris Kearns Goodwin says it this way, this written exchange, the first in six years, led Roosevelt to send Taft a draft of a speech he would deliver in late March. Taft read the speech and offered suggestions. Teddy included Taft's suggestions in his speech and happily thanked him. These cordial exchanges renewed Taft's optimism that Roosevelt might finally be ready to reconcile. The Blackstone Hotel, May 26, 1918. This is a very, very special story. Goodwin says this, on May 26, 1918, six years after the election that ended his presidency and fractured his party, William Howard Taft arrived for a conference at Chicago's Blackstone Hotel. As Taft was retiring to his room upstairs, the elevator operator informed him that Colonel Roosevelt was presently seated alone in the dining room. I hear he's leaving right away, the young man remarked. Taft did not hesitate. Then I'll ask that you take me back downstairs, he responded. You see, are you ready for the moment in the Blackstone Hotel? You see, Roosevelt doesn't know Taft is there. But now Taft knows Roosevelt is there and he's seated in the dining room all by himself, but he's just about to leave. Oh, I wish I had more time. Oh, that's too bad that I didn't know he was gonna be here, but I have to get back to my room and you know, I need to take a bath. You know, whatever it is that we come up with our immediate justifications instead of seizing the moment for reconciliation, then I'll ask that you take me back downstairs, he responded. Goodwin says this, hurrying across the Blackstone's dining room, which was bustling with nearly a hundred diners, he spotted Teddy at a small table by the corner window. Theodore, he exclaimed, I'm glad to see you. Roosevelt rose from his seat and grasped Taft's shoulders. Well, I am indeed delighted to see you. Won't you sit down? All across the room, customers rose from their dinners and wait staff paused, recognizing the significance of the meeting. Suddenly, the chamber erupted into applause. Goodwin says, New York Tribune reporter John Leary, who was traveling with Roosevelt, heard the loud ovation from the lobby. Joined by curious members of the hotel staff, he started up the stairs leading to the dining room. Encountering a patron who had witnessed the hoopla, he asked what had incited the outburst. T.R. and Taft's got together, the man explained. They're holding an old home week. By God free, I never was so surprised in my life, Roosevelt later told Leary. I no more thought of him being in Chicago than in Timbuktu, but wasn't it a gracious thing for him to do? There was so much commotion when they first greeted each other, he exclaimed. He explained that he could hardly hear what Taft was saying. I don't mind telling you how delighted I am, Roosevelt added. I never felt happier over anything in my life. It was splendid of Taft. I don't know if you guys feel it like I do, but there's something so special and heavenly in what is taking place in this story. And if any of you have ever touched it, brushed up against it, where that which seems lost, but you desire to be found, and then when you find it, it is great rejoicing. Like the description here, I never felt happier over anything in my life than just seeing Taft. No, it's more than that. It's being restored with Taft. It's something that was lost that's found. It's interesting, but just like that story of the 99 sheep and the one that goes wandering off, 
And it always seems a little extreme that the shepherd's going to leave the 99 and go after the one. Or how about that coin? She's going to call up all of her neighbors and say that she found a coin? However, what Jesus is describing is this. He's describing, you could have a great relationship with all sorts of people today, but it's the one that is restored. That is where the special significance is. There is something about the power of what heaven desires in our life. That when it is found, it touches us in that magical spot inside of us, and it's like angel choir goes off. And it is special. It is wonderful. As Roosevelt said, I never felt happier over anything in my life. Goodwin says this, the two men talked together like a pair of happy schoolboys until Roosevelt had to depart to catch the night train to Des Moines. Taft was beaming, one witness reported, and Colonel Roosevelt, leaning half across the table, was expressing himself very earnestly. Meeting Leary on the way out, Taft could not disguise his elation. Isn't he looking splendid, he said. I never saw him looking much better. Asked about the nature of their conversation, Taft simply replied that they discussed patriotism and the state of the welfare of the nation. His smile suggested that a far more important exchange had occurred. Describing the meeting a week later to Henry Stimson, Roosevelt confided that at long last they had completely renewed the old friendly relations. Only six months later, Teddy is going to be in the hospital for six weeks and in severe pain, he's going to be constantly throwing up. He has a lot of baggage from his grand adventures, especially his one to South America where he caught malaria and he nearly died on that trip. He's lost an eye. His digestion is not working well. I mean, this poor guy has fallen to pieces. He's lived a very robust life. But he's going to arrive back at Sagamore Hill. That's his home. After six weeks in the hospital, he is physically suffering. This is what his wife says. Edith Roosevelt says this. I think Teddy had made up his mind that he would have, would have to suffer for some time to come. And with his high courage, had adjusted himself to bear it. He was very sweet all day, January 5th, 1919. And Teddy died in his sleep that night. Six months after this meeting with Taft, Roosevelt dies. I just want you to ask or float this thought. How valuable is that restoration in this relationship? If you're Taft, for instance, or you're Teddy, you see, the impact upon our lives, Taft is going to go on to have an incredible career. And he's going to become chief justice of the Supreme Court. And he's probably going to have far more impact upon our country in that position than he did even as the president, or even if he had been elected in 1912. And so I guess, oh, this is, by the way, the communications. Archie Roosevelt is going to send a cable to his brothers in Europe. The old lion is dead. The world was shocked. This guy was untouchable. He was like, he w you couldn't kill Teddy Roosevelt. And so that's what leads the vice president of the United States, Thomas Marshall, to say this. Death had to take Roosevelt sleeping. For if, it, if he had been awake, there would have been a fight. Saying goodbye to a friend. Goodwin says this. Snow had fallen the morning that Th 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 Theodore Roosevelt was laid to rest. But the sun had come out by the time Taft arrived at the church. You're a dear personal friend, Archie said, taking him by the hand and directing him to a pew in the front. Goodwin says this, as Theodore Roosevelt's casket was lowered into the ground, an isolated figure stood quite apart from the others, William Howard Taft, softly crying. The grand impact of humility. You never regret it. You know, in the moment when you are the one humbling yourself, you're the one admi admitting wrong, you're the one admitting weakness to try and overcome an obstacle, you feel like so obtuse, so awkward. It's difficult, but you never regret it. If any of you have gone through this, you know exactly what I mean. When you called up your parents or talked to a friend and said, look, I'm sorry, what I did was wrong. If you've ever done that, I mean, it's not easy to do. But when you make things clear, it's incredible the restoration process that you go through. And the awkwardness on one side pales next to the benefits gained on the other. So the grand impact of humility. I mean, just look at this, the impact upon Taft's life. This is what Taft is going to say to Bamey, Teddy's sister, years later. I want to say to you how glad I am that Theodore and I came together after that long, painful interval. 
Had he died in a hostile state of mind toward me, I would have mourned the fact all my life. I loved him always and cherish his memory. So I'm just going to finish up this whole series with some finishing thoughts. This is just a quote from a man that knew him well, and there's going to be a gathering, I think it was in 1923, of all these men and women that worked with Teddy, and they're just going to remember him, and they're going to give stories and quotes and various things, and they're going to create some kind of compilation. Boy, would I love to be a fly on the wall for that one. And this is one of the things that was said from Herbert Knox Smith regarding a trip that Roosevelt and I don't know what, I think it's supposed to be his staff. I'm not sure what his hand took in 1907. I'm not sure what that is. But it's that he and Roosevelt took in 1907 down the Mississippi River. So this is what Herbert Knox Smith said. Above all the pictures of him in my memory, one stays always clear as the most wonderful and imposing in its silent presentation of the leader and the lead. I don't think he ever knew of it. He was making a long trip by boat down the Mississippi River in 1907. Governor Pinchot and I were in the steamer just behind him. The night was very warm, and Mr. Pinchot and I took our mattresses out into the open rear deck to sleep. But I didn't sleep because of what I saw through the night. On one long reach of the river, and the same on the next, we would catch a point of light in the darkness ahead. It would grow to a flame of fire of driftwood on the shore, As we came abreast of it, there would be an American flag driven in the sand, and about it, a quiet group of 20, 50, 100, or even 500, silently gazing to watch the passage of the sleeping leader. All through the night, along the great stream, in the heart of our land, those points of light twinkled far ahead and grew bright and near, shone abreast of their groups and their flag, and then fell astern. We were never out of sight of them, as far as I could tell. I doubt if he knew it. But that night and its beauty, its steadily recurring points of light and love, its silence and its vastness seemed somehow to me to carry, beyond the power of speech and pen, the heart and meaning of his leadership, the heart and meaning of our response. So I finished each of these uh, sessions with a question. Here's question 12. Do we have a Roosevelt in our life right now that we are presently at odds with? Are we willing to ask God to open a window of opportunity that we might, in our next visit to the Blackstone Hotel, find our personal relational challenge sitting in the dining room, just waiting for our outstretched arm of mercy, grace, humility, and love? And I've also finished them with a quote. Teddy Roosevelt, quote number 12. Teddy on seizing the opportunity when it presents itself. Teddy said this, great thoughts speak only to the thoughtful mind but great actions speak to all mankind. You could think it up in your head, but what's gonna change the world is when you speak it with your action. You do it. In this message, it's sort of strange to finish a series on life and leadership lessons of Teddy Roosevelt with Taft being the one putting to action everything that Teddy espoused, but that's also really precious to see how we do need our tafts in our life when we're a Teddy. And to cherish the fact that God has put people in our life that aren't always the easiest to deal with and sometimes approach things in a weird way, especially for our minds. But when we embrace them, and especially when we accept their outstretched arm to us if they ever extended. Or if you want to flip the story and you want to be taft in the storyline, then I want you to recognize that even though Theodore Roosevelt has, is a little... Difficult to deal with at times in his rough and ready way. But is he not deserving of your friendship? And is he not that dear, sweet friend that you've always had? And wouldn't it be a wonderful idea to go back down in the elevator, to walk into that dining room and to extend your hand? And just maybe he'll extend his back. And just maybe you can see something rekindled and something restored that the enemy tried to divide and break apart. Father, that is our prayer, our request, our ask, is that you would restore what the locust has eaten, that you would show yourself as the God of redemption, the one that takes what the enemy has tried to do in an evil way and translate it and transform it into a picture of your good. Lord, this is something that you specialize in. So we say, please, 
showcase your redemptive power in our lives, in our relationships, in our circumstances. Lord, if we have a Roosevelt, I pray that you would give us a Blackstone hotel dining room opportunity. Lord, we want to seize it, to set claim to it, and to see you work your miracles in our lives. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen.